Sun Devil fans, there was a lot of basketball this last weekend, and we're going to be recapping all of that for today, talking about both the basketball games and how ASU fared at each of them. We're also going to be talking about what the football team is missing, right, through the first wave of uh, all the transfers. Where else could they look to upgrade before the start of next season? You're listening to the Locked on Sun Devils podcast. Sun Devils, your daily podcast on the Arizona State Sun Devils, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to a Monday edition of the Locked On Sun Devils podcast. Uh, before we get started today, I just got to let you guys know that today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Uh, Bet Online has you covered the season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. This is also, uh, we just want to thank you for making us your first listen every single day. We are free and available on all platforms. Those platforms consist of uh, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or the Odyssey app, wherever you get us in an audio platform. And we are also on YouTube now. So make sure you take advantage of both of those options wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, Richie is going to be out for today. Him and I are going to be doing a little bit of flip-flopping this week. I'm taking today. Uh, he will be taking the Wednesday podcast as I will be out. Uh, at the ASU Oklahoma State, one of those uh, baseball games that I will be catching this week. Going to take a look at Willie Bloomquist and how his team is heading or uh, is is faring so far, I should say. Uh, but as far as today goes, let's get into this a little bit. As far as some of the basketball this weekend, so uh, first game up against Colorado. Rich and I came on the podcast and tell you that Colorado's playing pretty well. Colorado has won five in a row. ASU had just come off their loss against UCLA and. It's not so much that we shouldn't believe in this ASU team after losing to a UCLA, but clearly this team has been very up and down all season long. Uh, of their last five or six games, that was the game we had called out and said, hey, if if they go on some sort of run, right, they, they end the year hot, they make some sort of run at the tournament and win it, which, uh, again, we are absolutely holding our breath for that. If they had lost to a UCLA at the end of the regular season, not a surprise there. What is surprising, at least about this game, is how ASU won. Not only did they win, but they won convincingly 82 to 65 on the road. It did start off somewhat close, but really Arizona State, once they pulled away, they never, never looked back. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the players in this game and kind of how they also carried over into uh, the game against Utah a little bit later on in the podcast. But Jay Heath led the way as far as uh, points go. He had 18 total points. We also had guys like Marion Jackson, who is again contributing um, he, he does have an off game every now and then, but uh, otherwise, um, he led the way with 18 points. He had 17 from Ryan Jackson off the bench, 15 from Luther Muhammad, well, which is definitely nice to see, uh, and then 14 from Jalen Graham. Very quiet game again from DJ Horn. Did shoot nine, uh, nine shots, but only made three of them. Hit two or four from deep, but otherwise, very quiet overall. So the, the biggest thing about this was Colorado did not play their game. Colorado was uh, it was the best three point team as far as Pac-12 teams go, and in terms of uh, three point percentage, uh, so they led the Pac-12 probably at about 36, 37 percent as a team. They shot just under 26 percent as a team. Um, also shooting under 40 percent from the field. ASU did the opposite. ASU shot over 49 percent from the field as a team uh, and shot over uh, 52 percent, almost 53 uh, percent from deep, going nine for 17. Now. Arizona State, I believe, has the most amount of uh, three uh, three point attempts in the Pac-12, and also uh, has the lowest uh, lowest rating in terms of efficiency there. So, uh, not too glowing on Arizona State most games. That being said, they they definitely came away with it this week. Um, also went 13 of 15 on their free throws, but got production uh, kind of from uh, multiple places, right? And sometimes when we talk about production, especially in college basketball, it's who's kind of getting double digit points, right? How many shots are they taking to get there? Um, in this case, multiple players get over 14 points, which you haven't had uh, happen in too many games. In this case, case you had four, those being Jalen Graham, Jay Heath, Luther Muhammad, and Marion Jackson. So definitely great to see. Um, again, it, it's more so shocking in the way that they pulled this game off. We had, we're not used to seeing this necessarily from ASU. They themselves put up 82 points. They put up 45 in the second half alone. Uh, but the game started very much with Jay Heath and uh, Jalen Graham kind of going back and forth, leading the way. So if we can continue to see more of this down the stretch, 
it's going to take everybody from ASU to be able to pull off some sort of miracle run at the tournament. Now, we still have two more games to get to uh, over the next week or so before that Pac-12 tournament even begins. Uh, so we, we probably shouldn't even be talking about that until we get there. But that being said, definitely great to see from ASU. Uh, again, quiet day from DJ Horn and also from like a, a Kamani Lawrence. Kamani Lawrence, very early on this season, had a, a very strong start, I would say. Uh, I, I know Rich and I had a, a, a segment uh, probably about a month, month or two into the, the basketball season, probably right before their games got canceled, talking about kind of who was their MVP up to that point. I, I would say that those those titles are going to change definitely towards the end of the year. Kamani Lawrence, at that time, in my opinion, was the MVP of this basketball team, even though uh, DJ Horn was playing very well. Kamani kind of gave you everything all over the court, right? Was rebounding well, had assists, steals, blocks, whatever, whatever statistical category you wanted to look at. If he wasn't leading the team, he was one of the top leaders. Uh, but as far as his performance overall, it nothing nothing uh, overly sparkling. Only had five five attempts and only made one of those shots. So uh, did make three of his four free throw attempts. But otherwise, uh, Kwani Lawrence has been quiet as of late. I, I think he would be a little bit more of an X factor for that Pac-12 tournament if they do go on a run. Right, You're starting to see some uh, somewhat consistent production out of Jay Heath. Brian Jackson certainly is playing very well. Uh, and then if DJ Horn, again, it's kind of something we've been teetering with. He, it feels like he's not playing up to what he has throughout the season. It feels like he is either taking less shots or it's just less efficient when he does take more shots. Either way, he's not providing the most that we feel like he can. Um, but if you can get some of those guys, again, playing well and Kamani Lawrence back, and you have a not only a solid starting five, but have some depth to go with it, that's going to be nice. You might have some more victories, like this game of 82-65, to 65, uh, against Colorado. So this kind of goes along. Uh, this is now, uh, this was their fourth victory in five games and kind of goes with some of the uh, the other games they played as of late. When they're winning, they're winning big. They're not just winning by five anymore, right? Uh, so and part of the reason for that, if you go look at the box score a little bit, in terms of overall rebounds, we rebounded Colorado out, uh, by 38 to 26, which was a total opposite the first time that we played them. Um, so that wasn't, uh, wasn't even close. Um, assists, we had more than them. Seals, we had more than them, uh, and we block, or uh, we tied and blocked. So at the end of the day, it's not just always about points, but how are you creating more turnovers, right? As a team, if you're getting that kind of production, if you are uh, playing well on defense, you know, stealing either or blocking the ball, if you're beating teams uh, in, in rebounds, assists, steals, and blocks on just about any given night, more than likely you're going to win. Obviously, if you're not shooting well uh, and your efficiency isn't very high, that's going to be an issue. But ASU had everything going for them in this game. Definitely great to see. Yeah, I remember um, I, I tuned in probably just two or three minutes after this game had started just because I was coming home at that time. Uh, and, and I ended up watching the rest of the game. And, and at that point, ASU really had seemed to just, they, they took off after the first or second media timeout, I should say. Uh, but otherwise, uh, again, this is this is what I'd like to see is a, a game where ASU did not even look back. Uh, we're going to talk about the game against Utah here in just a little bit where they kind of left the door open a little bit for Utah. Right, they were leading by a pretty sizable margin throughout that game. Um, at one point, we're up about 15 or 16 uh, with a, a decent amount of time left, um, and they let Utah back in. That wasn't the case with Colorado. It was not the case at all. They're certainly the better team than Utah, so I, I like to at least see that against a more quality opponent. But ASU has now put themselves in a situation where they can go on a little bit of a run here. Um, if they and they did win against Utah, but if they win their last two games and they continue the top. Man, I, I think, and I, I think this was even mentioned maybe going into the game against UCLA for game number two. I don't think teams are at least going to overlook ASU. I don't think you can, right? They've got enough victories, they've got enough solid play in some of these teams that if you sleep on them, they might be able to take advantage of that. I, I say might because they seem to do some unpredictable things at times. These are our college students, right? They're not perfect professional athletes. Uh, but that being said, definitely a great win. So with that, we'll go ahead and break for the first time as far as this podcast goes. We're going to talk about the second basketball game played over the weekend against the Utah Utes. But before that, we have to talk to you about one of our sponsors. Uh, you're listening to the Locked on Sun Devils podcast. So Sun Devils fans, we have to talk to you about Bet Online. Uh, football season might be over for this specific season, but basketball is still in full steam for both pro and college hoops. From all the latest odds, totals, player performances, props, and where to find the next 
uh, fire head coach and where they're going to Line.net is the number one spot for all your sports betting needs this season. Betonline remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. Betonline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, and UFC uh, odds right to the Olympic coverage and information. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Betonline, where the game starts. You're back for the second part of the podcast today. Again, thank you so much for making Locked on Sun as your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. Now talking about the second basketball game over the weekend, ASU pulls out a victory against Utah. Uh, Mariano Jackson had a great, great layup at the end of that game that just absolutely sealed the victory, right? Marion had beat several guys to the rim. Not only did he beat his defender, but there were a couple other guys in the paint that potentially could have made that block. Um, and after everything was kind of going wrong for ASU the last three minutes of that basketball game, Jackson was able to close it down. But um, a little bit of a surprise for this one. DJ Horn was held out due to a non-COVID illness is all we seem to know so far. Um, so I guess that is good in the sense that he doesn't have an injury. We don't think it's going to be anything that lingers. Uh, also doesn't have COVID. So it uh, doesn't necessarily have to have a negative test per se. But um, all we have so far is it was just uh, uh, an illness that is non-COVID related. That being said, Jay Heath leads the way again, back-to-back games. Had 18 against Colorado, had 20 against the Utah Utes. Um, so Jay Heath is coming into a, his own at least a little bit. Uh, Marion Jackson did not play particularly well this game, but again, with his recent stretch of play and, and him being clutch at the end of it, I, I don't know how you can't take that, right? So if for Marion Jackson to have a really inefficient night going two for nine, uh, did make one of his six uh, three-point attempts. It just kind of is what it is. But the three point percentage, or sorry, three point shooting percentage in this game is absolutely horrible. Uh, in the first half alone, I think uh, the two teams combined were like maybe a, uh, it was like, I don't know, three for 26, six for 29. I, I can't remember exactly what it was uh, off the top of my head, but the team, both teams were not shooting well from deep. So it's not like it was just uh, Marion Jackson. Overall, ASU shot 27.3%, which is about what they've been this year. Utah shooting 26.1%. It's not good, really got better in the second half at all. Just neither of those teams were able to find the rhythm from deep, uh, which in one sense, at least if your opponent can't hit uh, those three-point shots, uh, at least it's not going to kill you uh, on nights that you can't, right? Because this is total opposite. They've, this was almost uh, half of what uh, ASU was doing the game against Colorado. So, uh, But overall, other contributors, you had Jalen Graham, who put up 15. Kamani Lawrence, who had 10, so a, a little bit of a, a nice rebound game. Uh, and then Luther Muhammad had another 10 after he had uh, double digits against Colorado. But shorthanded bench, so a lot of guys saw some extended minutes here. Uh, Jemiah Neal also had 17 off the bench. Uh, so basically everybody but uh, Enoch uh, Boachi had uh, at least double digit minutes, or I should say at least 17 minutes. So this game for ASU, they led three at the half. This was very, very back and forth throughout the entire first half. Uh, and for ASU to pull away at the end of it, uh, was definitely good to see. In the second half, AS really picked, uh, picked things up and, and kind of kicked it into gear. Um, Anthony, essentially, uh, the guard from Utah, was almost all of their scoring. He put up 19, uh, but Carlson for them also put up 15. But it felt like they never really had an answer for Anthony. Uh, and the dude was clutch. Um, he Every time it felt like they needed a big shot, Anthony was the one taking it. Um, so when they were up double digits... I mean, it really felt like this game was almost out of reach for Utah, but no matter what, like it just felt like they kept clawing their way back into this game. And, and overall with the inefficiency of the Sun Devil shooting in this game, not, not necessarily uh, if they, if they were picking a time necessarily to not play defense particularly well, uh, that was not a time to do it because ASU almost couldn't overcome it. And yes, they won by two. Yes, it was a, a good win for them considering they're stringing these wins. It is five out of the last six. Uh, they're really close to going up against uh, uh, going to overtime against Utah. Uh, not a great shot to end that game, I will say. Uh, not the best shot selection, but overall, they were trying to just force overtime and kind of get into it. But at the end of the day, you got you got to be happy with Jake Heath, right? Put him twenty points in this game. He's got thirty eight in his last. Um, overall, the team at least shot well from the field, right? They shot forty nine percent, but only made twenty seven percent of their threes. So uh, this team has not been the best a small ball kind of basketball team throughout the season. It feels like they don't have many layups. 
so uh, again, for Mar uh, Marion Jackson to win the game on a layup, we just it feels like they haven't done very much of that this year. It feels like they have more dunks than they have layups, which is just odd, or, or even have missed easy layups throughout the season. So uh, for the team to shoot well, at least inside uh, uh, from deep this game, at least is nice to see. So at least they weren't struggling from multiple ends of, of the, the court, so to speak. Overall, in terms of rebounds, uh, we again beat Utah in this game 35-28. Uh, in terms of assists, pretty much tied there. 14-13 steals was 2-9. to nine. So that was a big deal. Utah had nine steals overall. Uh, a lot of it came at least in the first half, I would say. Um, but again, you can't let somebody out steal you that. Because that's seven extra possessions, right? That's seven possessions where you potentially could have put up points, assuming you're not going to do it on every single one of those uh, one of those drives. But regardless, you're giving Utah that many more times to be able to score the basket. Uh, something that you can't do. And blocks were basically about the same. So uh, overall, we basically beat them in rebounds. And then they absolutely destroyed us in steals. So where do we go from here? ASU, again, has won five of six. They've won two in a row since that loss against UCLA. They do have uh, only two more games to end the season to get uh, both Cal uh, and Stanford to end the season. And they get both these games, I believe, at home. So that's going to be some much-needed rest before they go into each of these games. That being said, can they pull off this four-game sweep? Right after the game against UCLA, can they do what needs to be done? Can they win those four games and bring that confidence into the Pac-12 tournament? Right? I even kind of said this in the first part of the podcast. I am probably getting a little bit ahead of myself. Probably shouldn't be talking too much about uh, maybe who are they going to play in the tournament uh, if they win it. Right? They have to win these games one at a time. But that being said, if they have to play, uh, they get both Cal and Stanford at home, which is going to be a big deal. They played a close game uh, to Stanford the first time, only losing by three. And then I believe uh, they also lost by a pretty sizable margin, uh, almost by, I, by 25 to uh, to Cal. I think it was uh, their first game of this year. I think it was like early January. They lost like maybe 74, 75 to 50. Um, so that the game against Cal shouldn't, like that shouldn't be the biggest concern, right? Uh, as far as this year goes, like Cal is right behind you technically in the standings. They are sitting at ninth, uh, or I should say 10th now. Um but they're sitting at five and 13 in the conference while you're eight and 10. Uh, Cal is not a good basketball team. Not that we have been dominant per se. Overall, we have a very similar record. We've just taken care of more business within the conference. Um, but if you have to face both Cal and Stanford, who ironically are the teams just below you and just above you in the conference standing, that's at least a good place for ASU to be, right? If they take care of both these games, regardless of what Stanford does, even if they win any games they have left, you're going to take uh, the lead over Stanford in terms of uh, um, just because, like, let's say they each have two games left. You're going to get that win over them, giving you at least a, a game in front of them, uh, moving you up a position. Now, both Washington and Washington State are, are also basically about a, a game, game and a half uh, as well with these two games. You don't play either of them to end the year uh, with these last two games. So that is a little bit out of your control. But at the end of the day, instead of just trying to figure out where they can get the best seed overall in their standings. ASU just has to win these two games, right? Take the confidence from their last, what would be, uh, they win seven potentially out of their last eight if they can make this sweep. They need to take that into the tournament. And as I mentioned earlier, teams aren't going to overlook ASU. They're going to see how they're playing uh, as of lately. They're going to see the game against UCLA where they were able to pull off those, uh, that victory uh, in here in Tempe, I should say. Uh, the two games against Oregon that they were able to sweep them, playing USC and Arizona tough at times throughout this year. It could be a, at least a bit of a, a dangerous team that teams are going to keep an eye out for. How far are they going to go? Too soon to say. All right, let's see if they can get through these next two games uh, and hopefully get DJ Horn back and healthy if he can come back from his illness. Uh, but if you can get that, you can get Jay Heath playing well. Uh, and again, Marion Jackson bouncing back after a, a poor game compared to what he's played as of late. This team's going to be dangerous. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit more throughout the week as we get closer to their second to last game. Uh, but before that, we're going to talk to you about another one of our sponsors here, uh, talking to you guys about Built Bar. Guys, so it's that time of year again. If you're like us, at least in the past, you might be giving up on all your New Year's resolutions by now, but not this year. Rich and I are both sticking to our resolutions and we're going to eat right. And we... We credit that to Built Bar. It almost feels like it's not really resolution because we actually are eating them and enjoying them. If you guys tried the puffs, 
If you haven't, you're just missing out on one of Built Bar's best tasting protein bars. Puffs are the first ever protein infused marshmallow. They're fluffy, marshmallowy. They're not just a protein bar, they're a treat, and they're covered in 100% real chocolate. Puffs are a fan favorite and with some incredible flavors. Spanish churro, coconut marshmallow, banana cream pie, all those are so good. These are going to be your new favorite if you just give them a try. Low calorie, high proteins, replace your candy bars with these. They're even better. A typical candy bar can be anywhere from two to 300 calories. So if you go to built.com and scroll down to the macros chart, you guys are going to be blown away. High protein, low calories, high fiber, and low carbs. Most of Built Bar contains 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Now compare that to any candy bar, which is usually 240 calories, sugar, and dozens of net carbs. Those aren't even comparable. Mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, and a new flavor this month for white chocolate cookies and cream. They're all delicious and new flavors are coming out all the time, guys. So if you go to their website, you can find out what is coming out today. If you think uh, of a, a, a flavor might be good, they'll maybe uh, good for you as well. So Built Bar, they're all about taste and they make taste delicious first and then figure out how to make it healthy. I don't know how they do it, but they do it every single time. So go to built.com, use the promo code LOCK15 and get 15% off your order. Again, use the promo code LOCK15 for 15% off. .com. Heading into this part of the podcast today, talking to you a little bit more about football. What are the Sun Devils missing? Now, the obvious elephant in the room. They still don't have a quarterback, or they at least don't have a named quarterback. J.B. Daniels has internal and potentially at least uh, signed some scholarship rights with Mizzou. Uh, so I think until he officially enrolls in some of their classes, uh, he's not officially uh, signed with Mizzou. But one of his options, right? And Jane Daniels probably is not coming back. So that leaves them with Paul Tyson, Trent Morgay, or maybe somebody else that's out there through the transfer portal. Uh, maybe as um, some of these other teams kind of find out that, hey, as a back of quarterback, I can't compete with the guy in front of me. Thought I could, but coaching staff thinks that he's better than me. They're going to go his way. Maybe you get a handful of those guys that end up entering the transfer portal late in this offseason, and ASU picks them up. Again, that was the glaring need. What about all the other players that had left this offseason, right? Whether it was players entering the NFL draft, players that were graduating, or other people who had entered the transfer portal themselves. Uh, a guy like Tommy Hill would have been really nice to have a cornerback this offseason, but uh, he decided to transfer elsewhere. So with that, we have... Multiple areas we could honestly use help in. In my personal opinion, I think the front seven is going to be so, I don't want to say stacked, but I think they're going to be so set apart from any other grouping on this team. It's not even going to be funny. Now, the defensive line, it's not so much that they have an influx of talent. It's just you have Omar Norman Lott coming back. You have BJ Green, right? Jermaine Lole. You have uh, Trevez Moore. So um, you at least have bodies there while they're not necessarily familiar with the new defensive system. Uh, at least they've worked with a lot of confidence in that defensive line. Um, expecting a guy like Eric Gentry to step up with a little bit more playing time and Connor Soley. Maybe a Rodney Gross uh, also takes that other linebacker spot. I at least think that that front seven is going to be the best part of this team. The secondary is honestly, in my opinion, going to be the weak part of this defense. Uh, have bodies back there, but until you see them play, it, it just it doesn't give me a lot of confidence, right? Now, it's said in a lot, no matter what level of football that you're talking about, that secondary's best friend is going to be the pass rush, right? So if we are able to get after the quarterback this year, maybe that helps out our DBs just a little bit. Now we have uh, two incoming safety transfers, multiple corner transfers, and I wouldn't be surprised if they bring somebody else in, at least for competition. But at this point, I definitely wouldn't expect a big name. But the secondary is going to need some help. On the offensive side of the ball, and this is something Rich and I talked about early last week, but... You have two returning members of the offensive line that gives opportunities for other people to step up. It, I think they're going to move guys like uh, uh, Ben Scott around. It seems like he might be playing a different position come next year. Uh, and then also Henderson. Uh, I, I don't necessarily know if he's going to be sticking at guard, but we'll kind of see where that goes. But losing guys uh, like you did uh, with Kellen Deesh and uh, um, your previous center from this year, losing those guys, it's going to hurt, Right. You can't lose talent like that and expect them to play just as good or if not better with these new guys stepping in. So with potentially a packed work offensive line and a new quarterback, that is clearly a red flag right there. Now, ideally, they get enough guys in front of this new quarterback that 
They give him a chance to either hand off the ball or make an effective throw. But that also begs the question, who's he throwing to? Right? The cast isn't really changing, right? You have uh, Ricky Pearsaw still here, LV Monkley Shelton. Uh, you're losing your tight end in Curtis Hodges. Um, but he, even then, it's not so much that they used him a ton. He was just more effective. Um, but then after that, you have younger guys like an Andre Johnson uh, or Chad Johnson Jr. who haven't necessarily done anything uh, at the college level just yet. But it would be nice to find out if you either A, have depth, uh, or B, have a guy who can play on the outside. Um, Andre Johnson, I think, is going to be a guy that we continue to highlight because they don't they don't have that guy on the outside as of right now. So if they can find somebody to play out there, that was that would be huge, right? If outside of quarterback, I would say the receiver room is probably my next biggest question mark and then going to the offensive line. So with Rashad White leaving, that was already going to be a big step back. Losing other key pieces is going to make it a lot harder for this offense, right? I, I'm very excited for Glenn Thomas. Now I will say as of right now, we can't get too high or too low about a Paul Tyson or Trent Morgay. Uh, we just have to let them kind of battle it out and, and see what the reports are, right? People can be glowing coming out of their camps, so whether that's going to be spring ball or, or kind of leading up to preseason. But until it actually is, is seen on the field against real college competition, I'm just going to hold my breath. So as of right now, kind of a quick recap. You basically have your front seven, in my opinion, which is going to be pretty set. Maybe you're trying to figure out what the rotation looks like. Almost. Almost every other position is up for grabs, which is absolutely bomb. And it's not, like ASU is putting a, a decent amount of players at least through the draft this year. Doesn't mean they're all going to get drafted. They're all high caliber players. But if, if you have a ton of guys, even if they're going later in drafts, that's still quality. You have a lot of quality players leaving this offseason, potentially to the NFL. Um, so it's going to be very difficult to replace. You're losing a lot of potential veteran leadership, um, losing guys like uh, Chase Lucas, right? And Jack Jones, who have played for a while. That hurts. So not only you're trying to figure out uh, your talent, your depth, but you got to also find leaders, right? So in terms of overall, like what I want to know who those leaders are going to be. I feel like we can kind of point to either an Eric Gentry or Jermaine Lole on the defense. I can tell you one guy on the offense who that's going to be. Maybe a rookie, but I don't know his personality that well. I don't know if he's like a, a big kind of rah-rah uh, kind of a guy, but they're going to have to find who these people are, right? And those leaders are also going to have to step up. So with a ton of question marks, ASU is going to kind of figure some of this out soon. Uh, they do have spring ball on the horizon. So hopefully as we see some of those reports coming out, we'll, we'll kind of see what that looks like, right? Uh, but if you guys have any of the thoughts on maybe what the Sunbills could do to end up replacing some of these players, or maybe you're a little bit higher on some of these guys than both Rich and I are, tweet at us, guys. We're, we're more than happy to interact with you. Now, um, We definitely want to hear uh, the fan base's opinion. We do not speak for the fan base. Uh, we are just... Uh, guys that follow the team and hopefully kind of relay some of that information to you. So with that, we'll go ahead and close out the podcast for today. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single day. You can find us on Twitter. You can find me at Cedrios. You can find Richie at Richie Brads with the Z36. You can also follow us on uh, on Twitter for our Locked on Sun Devils Twitter page. That's going to be at LO underscore Sun Devils. Uh, so you can follow all three of us and we'll be tweeting at you guys with Sun Devils content. You can also find us Monday through Friday uh, in any sort of like audio or visual platform. So whether that's Google Podcasts, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the Odyssey app, you can also find us on YouTube as well. So make sure um, that if you guys are uh, following us on any of those platforms, hit the subscribe button, right? You're going to get a notification saying that Locked on Sunnels has given you a new episode and you're going to be the first ones to listen to it that day. But now make your second listen Locked on NFL Draft. Ryan Tracy and former NFL cornerback Eric Crocker bring the NFL draft to life every single day with insight and analysis on college football prospects and NFL front offices. It is free and available wherever you get your podcasts. You keep it locked on right here with the Locked On Sun Devils podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network.